everyone and uh, welcome all to this special broadcast on uh, DD India. When India took over the presidency of uh, G20, the Prime Minister Narendra Modi in Bali said that uh, data for development is going to be the integral principle, integral guiding principle for India, India's uh, G20 presidency. What India can offer in terms of uh, data democracy, uh, in terms of uh, new technologies, startup ecosystem. We have very special guest here in Bangalore, Mr. T. V. Mohandas Pai, who is a Padma awardee and a renowned, uh, uh, you know, professional in in the field of HR, in the field of uh, uh, IT and whatnot. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for uh, you know speaking to us. Uh, first of all, uh, we have just concluded uh, the Sherpa track, first Sherpa track, and the finance track meeting where the data and technology, the technological transformation is one of the core agendas of G20 presidency. How do you look at the agenda which has been set by the India to start with? I think the agenda has been set very well uh, because India is today the fifth largest economy in the world in nominal terms, third largest in PPP. India is a global leader in the digital revolution. We must remember that 250 years ago when the industrial revolution took place, it happened in Great Britain, age of the machines arrived and that led to colonization and impoverishment of India. In the last 15 years, the digital revolution has started and India is a global leader. And in the digital area, what India has done today, no country in human history has been able to do. And it has been driven by technology and data under the leadership of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. On August 15, 2015, our Prime Minister stood up in Red Fort and said, Digital India, Stand Up India, Start Up India. I don't think many people understood what he meant. But today, look at what has happened. We have the India stack, Aadhaar, 1.3 billion people, yeah. UPI, 7.3 billion transactions, $150 billion of money being transferred every single month. Yes. And then we have the ONDC, yeah. and then we have the EKYC, we have the personal data locker, and then we have the account aggregator, mm -hmm. and then we have other things like threats for financial inclusion. Yes. And using this technology, 475 million bank accounts have been opened. $300 billion of money has gone to the accounts of poor people uh, in the last eight years. This transfer is unprecedented in India's history. About 12 crore people have got gassed out and Prime Minister by just switching on a put, pressing a button can transfer money to nine crore farmers. Now it's incredible that's happening in this country. Indians consume 23 GB of data per month. We're the cheapest data plan in the whole world. We're going on to 5G. This incredible and a digital revolution is happening place everywhere. But this is happening because of something that India created, digital public goods. Yeah. Now all these We will talk about the digital public goods because it's, a, it's one core area that we are capable of you know, uh, sharing with the world and that's very important and that's what uh, my next question is. Uh, uh, but sir, uh, there are many countries where there is no uh, digital payment system like 100, 130 countries are there where we can offer these services. Like you said, the, for Aadhaar kind of uh, identity where, uh, which is originated from the Bangalore only. Uh, uh, there are 400 crore people uh, in the world don't have the identity at all. Then there are 200 crore people who don't have the bank accounts. I think these are all the areas where India has opened its gate and it's a great potential for Indian business to go and capture. Well, India has solved the biggest problem humanity has today in any country. That is, how does government reach the last person in the queue? And India has done that to digital uh, you know, innovation. So India can give this to all countries. Because most countries don't have the ability to write the software, create the platform. India has done it at population scale. Remember, we are 1.4 billion people. We're going to be the largest country in terms of population. We have done it in the last 12 years. And India can offer it free of cost. Because the Indian strategy of making them digital public goods means that all these platforms are owned by a public authority. A not-for-profit public authority. So innovators can use apps to build on top of them and create huge innovation. If they were captured and they were monopolized, they could be a global monopoly. And I, I think this is a unique Indian model. This sir. Is unique. No country has. Apple is a global monopoly. Yes. Android is a global monopoly. Google is a global monopoly. We don't want to be uh, imprisoned in a monopoly. Now we have an open platform. And this open system, open architecture done by volunteers in Bangalore under Nandan Nilakani, who is a great czar, has transformed India and transformed the world. And this is the model going forward. Because in the digital world, the key question that we have to answer as people on this planet is, who does the data belong to? Who owns the data? 
How do you use the data for public good? How do you make sure the data is not misused to control the minds of people? And India has solved the problem. And how do you prevent digital monopolies coming who have such enormous power that they can control your mind? But sir, that's what uh, is the real problem is. The data is being governed, be, being controlled by the big tech in the, in, in, in the USA, where the Google and the, and the Meta and, and the companies are into actually having a hold on the data. But how, how, do, how do we going for the democratization of data? Because this is the core issue. See, first of all, we need a global compact, a global agreement. 1948, I think the UN had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. For the first time, the world recognized all of us as individuals have rights and the rights have to be protected by the government and internationally. Now we need a universal declaration of digital rights. Mm. So all across the world, the world decides mm. whom does the data belong to. Yes. One, the data should belong to you and me because of personal data. Absolutely. Second, if somebody wants to use it, it has to be used by your permission. Yes. We need the data architecture mm. called for permission and it's called the data consent architecture. India has done that. Mm. And the third, the data has to reside in your country so that in case of misuse, your government protects you. Yeah. Now, I have so many malcontents in Delhi who say that, mm -hmm. oh, data can be anywhere else. In the United States, if my data resides there, I'm a non-resident alien. I'm not a citizen. They're not going to protect me. Yes. The data will be available to the NSA. Yes. Today, the U.S. has the largest cloud architecture in the world, the largest quantum of data of all the people in the yes. world. Yes. And the national security of the United States has free access to it. So they're not going to protect us. So it has to be here and our government is protect us and they say it will be misused. It cannot be misused because we have the courts. The courts will protect us. So this is a canard that's being spent. So we must have it here and you must do it. Yes, data has to be shared with other players provided that we give consent. Now that's a new architecture India has done. That's a new data bill. Once it's passed by parliament, it'll create institution yes. which protect us and that's the way forward and the role model for the world. But the key is, how do you protect data of the eight, 800 crore people around the world? And for that, we require an international agreement. And that Absolutely. international agreement should protect every individual because that's a new architecture that's required. That's very important suggestion that you have put forward about whether the G20 leaders will be you know, negotiating or agreeing on that. We'll have to uh, wait and watch. But we are currently working on the Digital India Act. Uh, you know the the data protection act all of them all you know three important acts are being uh, you know uh, done by the parliament but coming to the bangalore now uh, you know the geospatial technology we have actually championed and helped some of the g20 countries in the space technology in terms of communication and satellites i think this is one area where we are going we, we can show uh, the leadership uh, you know see india is a digital leader in the world let me give you some data this year we'll export 200 billion dollars of software the largest export of software services by any country in the world. 60% of global outsourcing comes to India. And we have, we'll have by March 5.5 million, 55 lakh people working in technology, second largest technology human capital in the world. Of the top 10 service companies in the world in software, five are Indian, top five, three are Indian. Of the you know, 3.1 million people working in the top 10, 2.1 million are Indians. Yes. Out in the U.S. of 6 million people working there, 1 million are Indians. And out of 9 million working for American companies, 3.5 million are Indians. So we dominate this field. And on top of that, we build startups, 84,000 startups, creating about <laughs> $500 billion of value. So you are preempting my questions. That's my problem. No, these are, <laughs> this is something unbelievable that's happened in this country. By 2026, we will have the largest pool of human capital in technology in the world, beating the United States, more than the United States. They may not be as sophisticated at the top end. We are 5 to 10% below because we lack money for R&D. Bangalore today has about in a population of about 1.1 crore, 22 lakh people working in technology, more than Silicon Valley. So all these technologies are available and we can offer this to the G20. And many of the countries in the G20, barring Europe and the United States, will not be able to get that. Or they'll have to pay through the nose. So India is in a great position to create a democratized world in the digital revolution that is sweeping the world and we have much to offer now we'll talk about the uh, startup ecosystem because you have preempted my question sir we are uh, third largest ecosystem in terms of startups we started with 160 startup now we are uh, 84000 plus every week we are uh, you know uh, creating a unicorn where do you see this startup ecosystem going forward because a delegation is right now in uh, you know in bangalore to actually Feel it on the ground. Well, we'll have about 200,000 startups by 2025 December. We probably will have 250 unicorns. We'll create maybe 1.5 trillion dollars of value, and that's going to grow. 
we'll have about 35 lakh employees by then. We already have about maybe 18 lakh employees in the startup ecosystem. And I think it's going to explode. But what it has done is to transform the views of our young people. Yes. We're getting a new generation of young entrepreneurs who are growing up in the digital world and interacting with young people in the metaverse. You see, today, you and I possibly are people of the analog world going into digital. Yes. The next generation is the digital revolution, digital, digital generation. The we'll generation after them yeah. who are 13 to 15 today are the metaverse generation. Yes. And the metaverse is coming with artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and with uh, you know machine learning coming, and with the genomics coming, and uh, robotics, humanoids coming, and all space technologies, and unmanned vehicles. We're going to see an upsurge of innovation, and India is poised there. What we lack is adequate capital. For example, China invests $135 billion a year. Uh, America invests about maybe $200 billion. Last year, we invested $42 billion because local capital is not going. Our financial institutions, the LIC, are not investing enough. Government has changed the policy, but we need that. We need more capital to go into this. It's happening, but it needs to accelerate. But we are going to be a dominant player. There's no country in the world which can be in the top two or three in the digital world as India is. And India will be the fastest growing digital economy in the world in the near future. I think, sir, uh, one of the core areas of discussion in the G20 presidency is also how to finance the startups. If the, uh, 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 can there be a model, a new model which India can propose to finance them? Because uh, uh, that, that's what the pr uh, problem uh, lies, you, as you are saying. Um, yesterday only, I think that the, uh, the, 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 the India's presidency have uh, proposed a blended uh, model for uh, you know, infrastructure financing where the public and private can join hands. What could be the model for startups? See, I'll confine myself to uh, venture and startups yeah, and not okay. to digital infrastructure yeah. because that okay. is huge. See, in venture and startups, you have to create venture capital funds. So I would propose a $10 billion venture fund of funds for G20, for which all countries give that and allocated to various countries outside the OECD mm -hmm. because they don't need capital mm -hmm. funded by everybody mm -hmm. in proportion to their uh, you know, uh, share in the global GDP. Uh, for example, out $92 trillion GDP, India is 3.15, so India will have to do maybe 3%, yeah. right? And this fund will be used to create funds in various countries because we have to create a venture capital system, a fund of funds. Fund of funds. India created a 10,000 crore fund of funds in For 2016, yeah. yes, yes, and I that know. has helped create the fund industry in a massive way. So we need the fund of fund. For example, you could do it in Indonesia. Indonesia fund of fund, out of this, you could give a billion dollars to Indonesia, billion dollars to India, a billion dollars to some other country. And these countries can, and they can invest 25% in every fund that comes up. And by doing that, you create a venture capital industry, you create fund managers. Now they will go search for all the entrepreneurs and give them capital. So you've got to create this ecosystem. Today, India has 1,300 AIFs. Mm -hmm. I mean, 2015, we had maybe 100, 1,300, 2,500 plus fund managers. Right. So I think it's incredible what is happening in this country. So a fund of fund for the G20 to give to all these countries is essential because we've got to create this system so that money can go in. It cannot be by government grants alone. Uh, I'll take a s short break, sir, here because uh, this interview will not be complete without, you know, uh, asking some questions on education part and HR, which you are champion of. Uh, a quick break will uh, will be coming back uh, right after this very short break, and we'll discuss uh, what are going to be the next uh, priorities when it comes to technology for the India G20 presidency. Your window to rising India, India's voice on global platforms. Latest news from India and around the world. In-depth analysis of global headlines. Watch DD India in your country. Available for downlink in Central Asian countries. SDTV broadcast is available through the satellite GSAT 17 at 93.5 degrees east. HDTV broadcast is available through the satellite GSAT 10 at 83 degrees east. For technical details, scan here. Switch to DD India now. Welcome back. Uh, you are watching an exclusive conversation with uh, Padmasri. TV Mohanda Pai, who is uh, in Bangalore right now, and we are privileged to have you, sir, uh, on this show. Uh, uh, welcome again. And 
what about education because this is one thing where uh, we are trying very hard to you know match up uh, the quality uh, uh, that, the, that the global world has uh, what what do you see the future going on because it's very key for the employment generation for you know people uh, yeah, let me know, give you data yeah. because i find <laughs> this kind of statement emanating from delhi uh, very often we have the largest education system in the world 1100 universities 55000 colleges about 3.8 crore young people in college and 1 crore graduating every year and 28% gross enrollment rate in the age group of 18 to 23 which should go to 50 I mean, it goes to 50, we probably will have 7.5 crore young people in college, maybe 2 crore people graduating every year. Okay? There is no country in the world in human history which can give high quality to all of them. So mm -hmm. let's forget about that. Mm -hmm. Even in the United States, the top 20% universities are very good, next 20 are okay, rest are pedestrian. Same thing all over the world, same problem. So we have to understand what education is. The new education policy has divided the education system into three parts. The first part, is research-based education where you have very high quality of research. Second is teaching institutions where there will be a little bit of research and the third are community colleges where you go and get an ordinary degree. So we have to be happy with that and create an upward movement and this three-tier architecture will create a movement for universities to go up. So we have to understand the reality of the situation and what we can do. What we have to do is to improve quality in education is to foster research. And the new education policy has got the right architecture. They have suggested the creation of a national research fund of 50,000 crores, for which 10,000 crores has to be given by every, uh, every year. I hope the Modi government gives it this year, because that will create research on a competitive basis with all universities, so people can compete for research grants. And once you compete for research grants, get research, and then you start the knowledge creation. That's what we like. Otherwise, teaching and all that is happening in a big way. We are improving. Are we like the United States? Yeah, but top 20 institutions are like the United States. Yeah. Are we at the top of research? No, we don't have money. It's not that we are not bright. We don't have anything. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have money. Give us the money. We'll show you what we can do. So I think the question is very simple. It will take time. We have to pump in a lot of money for research. We can afford it. Our GDP is 3.15 trillion. This year, the government, state and center, spent 75 lakh crores. Don't tell me they can't give 10,000 crores for R&D. Mm, they should mm, do it. Mm, mm. I think political class should do it because this will help us in the next 25 years. So I think the framework is there. The funding has to come and every state has to decide what it wants. Karnataka has got 66.5% of GDP from services. It's the, first, it's the most knowledge intensive state in the country. The government in Karnataka should give money for research because that gets the highest ROI here and it takes time so you have to do it now to be ready for uh, India when it becomes a much bigger economy coming back to G20 we have just started our uh, presidency we have uh, we have completed our first Sherpa and finance track uh, we have there are 40 uh, you know such meetings under the finance track only uh, for ministerial level meetings and then you know, in September we are going to have a big grand uh, event in New Delhi where do you see the future of G20 when we will talk uh, at, at the summit level in September. No, I'm sure India will work to create a consensus on many global issues. India will put the viewpoints of the global south because the G20 has been dominated by the G7 and the western countries dominate. Now they understand very clearly that China is going to eat their lunch, is eaten their breakfast. India is right behind growing very fast. The world has changed. We're in the midst of the digital revolution. We need a new global architecture. And the rise of India is the beginning of the new global architecture. Because China has risen to nearly 21 uh, you know, trillion dollars of GDP, as again the US 23 trillion, and that they see as a threat. Now, India as a democracy coming up and growing very fast in the next 10 years is obviously good for the world, and India's presidency will demonstrate that the global issues of climate change, of the digital revolution, of eliminating poverty, and sustainability all this have to be done by us together and we need global cooperation we need funding and india has the right view as possibly the largest most populated country in the world and under prime minister modi prime minister modi has taken this extremely seriously i've been watching g20 for many years i've not seen any uh, prime minister president of any country taking it so seriously as like prime minister modi because prime minister modi understands this is india's moment before the world where india will be placed before the world as the truly global power and the agent of change for the whole world, as the Vishwa Guru, as Vasudeva Kutubamam, right? Because Prime Minister Modi has said, one world, one family, correct? And one planet, one future, correct? Yeah. I mean, he has said that. I think that's fantastic. So that Indian view 
of making sure that we are people of this world we have to lead together we have to take care of nature we are take care of everybody yeah. everybody matters i think it's fantastic and there's a change in the global uh, g20 architecture Mr. Pai, it was wonderful talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. I, I think it's, it's a time of uh, time for India, as you as I have said. And 2047, our aim, our mission for being a developed nation is not too far. That's all in this exclusive conversation. Thanks for watching. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you.